the book, the green book, they call it, overview of the Better Ghana agenda. If you haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. That is our discussion. You know that the NDC launched this on Tuesday. Uh, and it talks about unprecedented achievements of the government. Of course, you have highlights of the unprecedented achievements. There's an introduction in there. And it highlights a number of things. It's quite a voluminous book. It has a lot of pictures um, to back all that it says. It's 87 pages. And uh, about half of it is dedicated to the pictures from across all the regions of Ghana, evidencing the projects being spoken of in the book. And indeed, there are many areas that are touched on, but we definitely, in an hour, cannot deal with the book cover to cover. So we'll be zeroing in on agriculture largely, uh, under the direction of my production team. And we'll also be talking about health. We'll be talking about poultry, uh, under agriculture particularly. And then I'm sure that when the opportunity comes, we'll delve into areas that we would have to. Of course, the vice president at the launch of the book, I mean, made quite a bit of news. When uh, he says that the green book is the cure for critics suffering from mental block syndrome and that we, we say that that's apparently in response to the MPP uh, which has over the past three years insisted that the Mills administration has been clueless visionless and with no record of achievement so that was the response to it many will remember that in Ghana in the old days or not too long ago we had a system where governments after 100 days will come out and say this is what we have done and be able to do previously you remember that the Kufu administration we had a Ghana then and Ghana now signboards all over the place giving us pictures of what roads look like, etc. And then the Kufu administration also published a book four years down the road as to what he has done. So it is not a very new phenomenon. I think that it's an emergent style where governments really do tell us what they have done. And that is what the NDC government is seeking to do with this one. In the studio to discuss these, top, these matters with us, um, from the far end of the table, Honorable Samuel Ofosuan Pofo is Minister, Local Government and Rural Development. Thank you for coming, Honorable. And on the near side of the table, a man who has been with us a number of times already, Dr. Michael Pesa White. Is it White Pesa? Dr. Pesa White. Either of them will do. Okay. White is middle. All right. So, Michael White Pesa yeah. is a research fellow, Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana. <coughs> will be joined on the telephone lines at some point by the president of NAGRAT, by uh, the former president of the Poultry Farmers Association, and also at Beko Benko, Fijoy FM Volta Regional Correspondent, to be telling us about the uh, Volta Region University, which also made some quite some news because it's listed here as one of the achievements for him to tell us from the ground what he sees there with regard to that. You can send your views. You obviously have views prior to the commencement of the discussion. So send them to 1760 across all mobile networks. It will cost you 30 pesos <coughs> per text. If you're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash multi TV world is the address. Let me begin with Dr. Pesa um, for. for obvious reasons i think that um you from where you sit and what you do policy etc analysis and all of that i want to just get a general a viewpoint of the overview of the ghana better ghana agenda for you what does this book represent and what do you make of it well i think a couple of things um it um in a nutshell seems to uh, capture some of what uh, the government have been doing over the last uh, three and a half or so years mm. And um, many of the specific issues that have been indicated here uh, suggest that there had been some work going on or there have been some activities being, being undertaken by the government uh, in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And of course, from the way they have been framed in the material itself seems to suggest that many of these things are still uh, ongoing. And to that extent, um, the records in the book speaks to um, outputs dimensions of achievements but does not necessarily speak to outcome and uh, impact dimensions of achievements. What do you mean by that? Well outputs dimensions of achievement refers to uh, numbers of for instance if we take, take schools uh, the numbers of schools that were built in relation to resources that were committed so um, we should be getting perhaps from this book mm -hmm. uh, in terms of total resources committed the number of schools that have been produced um, across the different regions or the different districts in the country mm -hmm. then when we talk about the outcome we are also looking at um, has these schools, uh, are this, have these schools moved beyond brick and mortar? How many teachers are in there? How many textbooks, how many chalks, uh, pens, pencils, computers, and, and so on and so forth are there to ensure that uh, our kids come out of the school um, as capable um, citizens that will contribute effectively to socioeconomic progress mm -hmm. in the country going forward? And of course, when we talk about the impact, um, we will expect that, and I think the book didn't go uh, very far on that, understandably so, um, 
we will expect that they will also tell us um, what they expect the impact of all these products and still taking the school as an example to be on society. So for instance, if you have, um, let's say, 1,000 kids turning, turning into the school system right now, mm -hmm. uh, you are expecting that a number of them will branch into the different disciplinary areas. So in the future, you are probably expecting now, you are expecting that in the future, maybe 10 years from now, you are decreasing the doctor-patient ratio from, let's say, um, a, an existing rate of maybe one to thousand today to maybe one to twenty or whatever the case may be, and I think that at this point, and um, we can only talk about the things that have been initiated, but we should also be able to ask for for what have this been initiated and what do we expect going going forward. Mm. Uh, otherwise, they will. We have seen many projects started very well by many governments in this country, and soon after those governments, those progr pro programs have been, I mean, folded up. In that sense, it becomes difficult to really point at them as achievements. So we need to go beyond um, just the initiation of these programs and also uh, put in place mechanisms to ensure that they are sustained for the long term. Let me bring it honorable into the discussion. And let me ask you, and again, make it a general question, general overview. What do you make of the book that has been put out by your government and um, what does it represent for you? Well, first of all, <coughs> the government uh, committed itself to open, transparent, and accountable governance. And for that matter, coming out to account for our stewardship in terms of what we've been able to do mm -hmm. under three and a half years is just to underscore the fact that it's excellent the president promised the good people of this country that he will operate an open and accountable government. Mm -hmm. And for us, this is part of the accountability process. Okay. Accounting to the good people of this country what we have been able to do with the mandate that they gave us. And for me, it is instructive because uh, until recently, His Excellency the President was called all sorts of names. Uh, I mean, led by uh, the MPP flag bearer himself, who called him Professor Doolittle. And we felt that the President indicated, when people were calling him that he was moving slow, mm -hmm. he indicated that slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. This is an indication that slowly but surely we are getting all the indicators, the promises that we give to the good people of this country. Okay. We campaign, our campaign was predicated on four main pillars, building a strong economy, mm -hmm. uh, a pretty open and accountable government, a human resource, investing in people, mm -hmm. that's human resource development. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the trust of, uh, you know, the mandate that was, bestowed on us based on uh, the promises that we gave to the people. Mm -hmm. This book just goes to underscore the fact that we are building a strong, resilient economy. We have, for the first time, inflation, a single digit standing there for almost two years. We have the highest uh, national uh, gross reserve. Uh, the economy is one of the fastest growing in the whole world. Mm -hmm. and, and so it tells you that, uh, indeed, when, once we promised that we we're going to build a very strong economy, every indication, the, the figures and the facts mm -hmm. speak for itself that our economy is very healthy and is growing. In fact, this morning, I just returned from Kumasi when I got to the domestic uh, uh, flight section of uh, Kotoka International Airport. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe what I saw. Crowded, mm -hmm. very, very crowded. About three different aircraft, very, you know, over 100 seater capacity moving to Tamale, Kumasi, and I mean, moving up and down, and people, uh, it shows you the kind of economy and the kind of environment that this government has created. Mm -hmm. Only yesterday, we were told that the Takrade port is choked. When you have a choked port, it tells you that economic activities are thriving and people are doing business. Go to Tema, have what? The same thing is happening there. It doesn't mean that there's slowness at the port. No, 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 no. Because I know somebody all. who had a difficulty, a f close friend, uh, actually ship getting his engine that he had imported out for over two months. The challenges are there. The, there. The, the challenges are there. <laughs> but because people are doing more imports, a lot of business are going on. Mm. So you have several, uh, you know, vessels. I live in Sakumon. I mean, mm -hmm. when you are going there, you see several vessels mm -hmm. on, the, uh, but on daily basis. Even when you go to the port now and you go to the motorway, you see the number of vehicles, hauling trucks and others moving. And that shows you a moving economy, an economy uh, that is healthy and that is bubbling. Okay. Interesting. Let me come back to you, Doc, and ask you, 
what made quite a bit of news when this book was launched was the word unprecedented. And we all know that it made quite a bit of news. Uh, people thought that unprecedented means something that has not happened before. And I don't know what you, you, you make of it. But looking at the highlights, there are so many things that are mentioned. Two public, someone said public, two public investments in Volta and Bronga Hafo. And I heard a particular criticism saying that it's not the first time any government is putting up maybe investees in, in this country that it happened in the past. And Chroma built uh, tech and all those other places and all. So do you think that the unprecedented is, takes anything away from this? Or really, unprecedented or unpre not unprecedented, this really states the case for the government? Well, my sense is that perhaps the unprecedented is probably used um, within the context of um, uh, the perceptions that have um, earlier on gone on that the government is doing nothing mm -hmm. and the, the government is um, perhaps directionless or the government has uh, left the country on autopilot and all sort of things. Right. And so I say, my sense is government is probably using the unprecedented to kind of uh, reverse these negative perceptions that might have already been very incipient within the larger society. But can but they change the meaning of a word just by responding to criticism? No, no, not, not necessarily. You, 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 you can't well, that seems do that. To be the, but, you, but I think what you also uh, perhaps need to keep in mind is that because they have used the word unprecedented, mm. the launching of this particular book for them uh, had caught on very well with media discussions and okay. everything. At least they've given something out to um, the the, <coughs> the critics and other people who um, might not necessarily be interested in reading the book to say, okay, well, if this is unprecedented, let mm. me go read it and co compare it to Nkrumah, Lehman, Rollins, mm. or Kufu, or whatever the case may be. Okay. So by using that particular adjective, um, my sense is that they are, they are trying to draw a much bigger public attention. Uh, and if you look at um, um, the, the book and the highlights, a lot of these things are things that I, I would call, um, m uh, what do you call it, um, uh, geographically specific development projects. Mm -hmm. Many of them are scattered, I think, across the country. Okay. Um, and they are, they are projects as opposed to policy-based um, development dimensions. When we talk about policy-based development dimensions, you are looking at maybe something like healthcare. When you touch it, you affect almost everybody. Okay. But when you are talking about something like, let's say, the establishment of a factory in a particular area, although the productions from that factory may go wider to mm -hmm. the wider market mm -hmm. in the country, mm -hmm. um, it's much more likely that it will provide employment to people in a particular local area. So they okay. may feel it a lot more than other people uh, within the broader society. Mm -hmm. So in that context, I would, I would not necessarily, uh, I mean, describe this as unprecedented as has been described mm -hmm. except that uh, I think it's a political strategy to make sure that people who uh, would not read it or people who might have not read it will go out there to uh, read it mm -hmm. I I think that I mean we all know that um, yes a lot of things have been initiated in this book as I, as I, I started reading it three yes. days ago and on and on but we can't say that what has been done here is far more than what someone like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, for instance, uh, did for this for this country. Why do you say so? Because I've also heard in previous discussions members of the current government saying that, listen, when they say unprecedented, they mean unprecedented. Because really, when you look at this top 90 that you're saying, yeah, you, it's it's easy to give Nkrumah and, and, and personalities like that a high point based on certain things they did and the newness of what they did. Yes, but that and and the current dispense the current dispensation and recent history, yeah, for them. When they talk about unprecedented and cite things like um, 1,700 communities being connected to the national electricity grid in just a space of 2000 to 2012, mm. that, and it, that is huge and can compare to anybody. Well, that's, when, that's and, and, and a few other things. Electricity coverage being increased from 54% to 72% nationwide in three years, etc. I heard the argument that well, they are no, ready to stand toe to toe. No, I think that anybody, I including think that <laughs> government needs to be commended for making sure that mm -hmm. the electricity is extended across board. Mm. But the question is, is power flowing through those lines that have been connected to uh, mm. those rural areas and mm. all those communities across <clears> board? <throat> of course, the connection is the first step to power flowing through, so mm -hmm. that the commendation needs to be there. But I don't think that it's total and complete yet. And so, really, to talk about it as unprecedented raises a little bit of, I mean trying to stretch the margins of, of... And of course, I will admit that Nkrumah operated within a particular political milieu, mm. and the current government is also operating within a particular and different political milieu. So Absolutely. for that reason, the comparison may not necessarily fit. Mm. It's probably like comparing apples and oranges. Mm. But if you look at some of the, uh, the things that have been stated here, for instance, a process to review the 1992 constitution uh, was, was put in place. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is something that uh, might not necessarily qualify as an achievement yet because we haven't seen the final product of mm of that particular process. Yes, it was initiated. We have known in this country that several commissions and committees have been set up to do different things and the reports end up on the shelves. Mm. I would have preferred if the commission's reports have been pushed through or recommendations that the government finds favorable or otherwise have been pushed through and work is ongoing to kind of make sure that the constitution actually gets that revision or amendment that is needed. Then we can, we can say that it's an achievement. At so this for point, you, 
a process to review the 92 constitution with the setting up of a constitution review commission which has presented its report at this stage yes. does not amount to an unprecedented achievement the report is an output it's a piece of paper with words and and sentences and phrases based on the commission's work it's an mm. output it right. hasn't affected us in any way yet mm. what is the outcome mm. of that particular report and mm. i don't think that we have felt the outcome yet and so it cannot in in that particular sense be an achievement yet of course the fact that somebody has taken the initiative is commendable and i think that that is something that we should mm. but taking the initiative alone is not enough you need to take the other step and move on then you can state it as uh, as an achievement okay. or, or, and, and so on and so forth okay interesting oh no but let me come back to you because i realized that when doc was speaking i saw uh, <laughs> some smiles on your face and all okay. but uh, uh, without i won't take you away from your the responses you like to state but really some say that when you come to the tape in the box they call it the tail of the tape uh, where we take your height, your arms, your etc. And they say Kwame Nkrumah, one side. Professor John Evans at the other side. We are looking at the construction of a township like Tema. We are looking at the construction of the Akratima Motorway in concrete. 3.4 million pounds at that time. You are looking at the setting up of the, the construction of the airports, the ports, in Tema, etc. And all of that. It's, it's strange to some people that your government would even dare to talk about unprecedented when you list the achievements you have. Well, uh, first, uh, first and foremost, let me just uh, respond. quickly respond to mm. the issue about the constitutional review uh, okay. issue. Please I think do. that uh, the constitutional review committee has done its work. Mm -hmm. They have done their general consult, uh, you know, national consultation across board. They have presented their report. As, as I speak to you now, the president has set up a technical team mm -hmm. which is looking at the various recommendations that has been made. So it's a, it's a process. It's a process. I mean, the effect will definitely come. But why do you call and it we are, we are, we are saying this that time. In, two and a half, in less than two and a half years' mm -hmm. time, look at the amount of work that has been done to review the whole constitution, mm -hmm. you know, over a period of time. Right. And, and we, we promise and we have delivered. And it's ongoing. And we believe that by, by, by the end of the, of the year, perhaps the outcome of whatever consultation and whatever recommendation have been done will be crystallized. Mm. But let me quickly say that I do not like a situation where all of a sudden, when we are talking about NDC's achievement, mm. then people are going back to just a post in Chroma against NDC. I think that let us look at our contemporary political environment. Let me understand you, Honorable, ourselves. and I'll, I'll, forgive me. Let me understand you. Highlights of unprecedented achievements. Are you suggesting to me that the over, this Green Book is comparing itself to President Kufu and President Rawlings. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it's a general view. It's a, it's a general headline that has been given to right. me. But I'm saying that we should not all of a sudden, you know, uh, but uh, when you use is, the word invite people. Well, let, let me, very let me, yeah, I, I'm, I'm starting <laughs> on the basis that if if you just go back to Nkrumah and say, look, this time it's about Nkrumah standing two to two against Professor Mas, mm. let's go into the details and see okay. whether the issues that have been raised are unprecedented okay. or not. Let's hear you. The first one is about 13.3% uh, economic growth. Mm. Highest in the entire history of the, of, of the country. Isn't it unprecedented? Now, the longest sustained single digit inflation, more than 20 months now at 8.6%. Mm -hmm. Isn't it unprecedented? Highest ever gross domestic reserve in foreign uh, gross international direct, uh, yeah, gross international reserves and foreign direct investment. One million tons of cocoa production. So these are some achievements which for us, in fact, even in the cocoa sector, we gave ourselves up to the end of 2012. Mm -hmm. By by 2011, we have achieved we the one million ton. Right. Again, we talk about establishment of investment. Everybody knows how the the, the road to traverse if you want to set up an investing. We promise that we'll set up two investors. But that's not unprecedented. Previous governments have set up investors. Well, previous governments have set up investors, but not in two and a half years' time. Oh. In two and a half years' time. They have, they have their charter. Mm. But is and it running? It's, it's, uh, I mean, go to who? I was surprised. And mm -hmm. I, I was in who? A couple of uh, weeks ago. Yes. And I went Are there pictures of it in the book, actually? The I, water university, no, those, I think. Those pictures, those pictures are not comparable with what you go and see in who today. Oh, so I, I felt that they should have given the current state of affairs when you go to the whole general hospital, the regional hospital, and the adjoining, you know, uh, uh, campus, satellite campus of, mm. the, of the new university. Are and, there people and there? Are there people attending the university? The university will start 
uh, this, this academic year. Okay. And as I visited there myself, I saw the number of infrastructure that has been developed. Mm. Lecture theaters, uh, you know, uh, bungalows for lecturers. I understand the vice chancellor bungalow and others have been, you know, already. Uh, the place have been paved. And, and several other developments. I actually don't see on. the university here, unless I'm not looking well. Uh, no, well, well, well I, I saw a picture, but okay, from, these, are, from, these are just bungalows for senior yeah, staff of the University of from, Health and Allied Sciences. From what I saw when I visited there, it's beyond this. Uh, some of these pictures were taken mm. uh, some time ago, mm. but I was there just a couple of weeks ago, about okay. one month ago. Mm. And what I saw, I was impressed. But, because but the question is, and I, I don't want to seem to be you know, uh, dealing a bit too much on, on this one, but basically about the unprecedented nature. Because I realized when you were reading the thing, when you got to EITI, you skipped. So, and, and we'll be talking about that, the, the uh, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative and the Open Government Partnership and, 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 and all of that. And we are trying to get... Okay, permit me to go to Agbeko Ben Kofi right now. He's a correspondent for Joy FM, uh, Agbeko Ben Kofi. Okay, and uh, we will uh, uh, get Agbeko right now. Let's see about the university pictures. Okay, that's page 18. There's a lecture, accommodation, other structures for the Volta University. We have it here on page 18. Good evening to you, Agbeko. Good evening, Nii. Thank you very much for joining us. Agbeko, can you tell us, um, are you able to pick, paint a picture for us of the state of the university in the Volta region? Yes, first of all, um, let me go back to where he says, Nancy President Mills, um, visited the Volta region to cut the sword for the commencement of work on the University of Health and Allied Sciences. And this happened on Monday, 7th um, February last year. Uh, he indicated that the university will have eight schools. Um, school of Medicine, School of Dentistry, School of Pharmacy, mm. School of Allied Health Sciences, School of Nursing and Midwifery, School of Sports and Exercise, and one faculty of biomedical science, and these schools will be located in Ho. Now, for the Hohoi campus, it is expected that School of Public Health and School of Traditional Alternative Medicine, in addition to Institutes of Medical Education, will be located there. But then the then minister responsible for the voluntary in Honorable Joseph Amenoda told us that a school will be starting in September last year. And he identified some structures, like Onko Sakai's facility in Hohoi, a school facility belonging to the Ministry of Health at Ajidume, a nursing training facility in Ho, and a facility belonging to the government secretariat all in Ho. So he described these facilities as incubatory facilities to kickstart or to start a project. Unfortunately, that did not happen. Mm. Then eight weeks ago, the University Implementation Committee, um, headed by uh, Madame uh, Christina Makunyama, tasked the Volta Regional Coordinating Council, and a contractor was um, sought to really put up structures to start the university near the Volta Regional Hospital. Indeed, His Excellency President Mills cut a sword at Soko de Lukwe. Mm. So the people thought that the school was going to start from there. But when government decided to put up a structure near the Volta Arena Hospital, um, they did not explain to the people. And that is how come the people are expressing surprise at the facility. But let's talk about facility proper. Okay. As we speak, Ni, we have four bungalows ready. And additional one uh, is yet to start. We have administration block uh, and a hostel facility and a lecture theater. Now, the bungalows will accommodate the registrar, the librarian, or the ICT personnel, personnel the director of finance, who, who doubled as the development officer and the internal auditor. Mm -hmm. These facilities for the bungalows, four are ready. But the other facilities that I've mentioned are almost ready but not uh, complete. They are still working on them. Now, there are two other facilities belonging to the Volta Regional Coordinating Council. 
um, that will accommodate the vice chancellor and the pro vice chancellor. And that renovation is ongoing as we speak. They've not completed that one yet. So where his excellency actually cut, cut the salt for the construction or commencement of business, nothing has gone on or there is nothing there as of now. And that is the situation as we speak me. So uh, you're saying, I need to get this clear. You've mentioned a few structures. You've mentioned yeah. a, um, a few structures for a few uh, persons uh, in certain positions in the yeah. university. Some are, are, have been completed. Others are still under construction. Yes. Are you able to, the Honorable Minister just said that next academic year, lectures will begin. Do you see any such signs of, of lectures beginning at the, at the next academic year? I don't know, when does next academic year begin, Doc? Well, normally it should be August, September. August, September. Okay, let's say September. And this is um, um, April, May, June, July, August, September. Five months. Do you see the Volta University up and running in five months' time as a university? Yeah, me... Um to go back to uh, history, those facilities were put up in eight weeks. Okay. And from what I saw when I went there, it's possible that considering the speed in which they put up these structures, it is possible that the investment may start in September. It is possible that the investment may start in September. And uh, uh, perhaps I shouldn't push you to pass too much judgment. Based on what you see today, the 12th of April 2012, yeah. um, as you've reported what you have seen, do, we, do you see, are you able, to, if you were to write a report or, or, or an article, would you say that we have a university in place in Volta Ridge? <laughs> That's a difficult one um, because um, the facilities that they put up, according to government, uh, are those they are going to use to start the university. So I can't say any other thing than to say that, well, these are what they say they are going to kick, use to start the university. And from the speed at which they put up these structures, there's no doubt in my mind that in September, as the minister kindly said, mm. that they will actually start the university as scheduled. I'd Considering the fact that the facility that I am seeing here and the speed at which they put up these structures it is highly possible. Once the minister says so, I want to believe him. Even though they gave same indication last year that in September they were going to start, but that never happened. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for bringing us this report from the Volta Region, Agbeko Ben Kofi. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. We are discussing the NDC Green Book, what has been, yes, represents the Better Ghana agenda and its overview of 90 unprecedented achievements. That's what we're discussing right now. We have the president of Nagrat on the line, but as I promised, uh, let's get Honorable of Osama Pofo's view, uh, uh, reaction to this uh, story on the university and what Agbeko also told us. Well, uh, 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 my, my reaction is very simple. Uh, Rome was not built in a day. And I believe that if you go back to find out uh, the history of University of Ghana and you ask how many students were used to start the university, and how many structures were there before the university started? I, I am an alumni of uh, uh, UMAT, University of Mines and Techno uh, uh, Technology. Right. It used to be uh, Takwa School of Mines. Yeah, that's right. How many students were there? How many structures were there? Mm -hmm. UDS. How was it started? It was started with a seed capital of $50,000, which was awarded to former President Rollins, uh, you know, and he decided the hangar prize also. The hangar, no, and he decided to invest it into the establishment of University of Development. They have traversed a very long way. Today, when you go there, you it, it is not comparable to any of the uh, trade traditional or four traditional universities that we have. Mm. But they are growing by the day. Mm. So, we, if we are talking about voter university, I, I think people are just looking up to the situation where overnight they want to see skyscrapers you know, uh, <laughs> lecture theaters and everything, and 10,000 people going to invest it. That is not how we start an investing. And I think that this is one of the shortest period that one has to go through and get a charter in less than two years, and then form a, a, a council, an university council, and then hit the ground running, and then infrastructure is going on, and the university is taking off. I mean, if they even start with 50 or 100 students, the voter university has started. 
And that, for me, is the most important thing. It will take incremental you know, uh, progress to get things in shape. I think for, 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 for budgetary purposes, we cannot commit all the resources of the country to go and put up all the infrastructure requirements. In sometimes, even private sector support, community support, people give, uh, give out some of their uh, houses and others for uh, letters and others to take. I mean, even today, in, in the established universities, people are still using hostels. So once the university is starting, I believe that private entrepreneurs will be encouraged to go and put up hostels, go right. to Kofurudia Polytechnic. Right. The Polytechnic has a population of over 8,000. You know, they couldn't uh, you know, accommodate all of them. Private individuals have put up hostel facilities there to support government. So for me, I think it is not government responsibility alone. It is a shared responsibility. And the private sector will take advantage of the opportunities offered by the establishment of the university and invest also there. But let me quickly talk about the, this issue of unprecedented. I mean, when oh, my... We will when, do that. When, when, I, when, have when doctor, I have not got on the line. Jump, and went to constitutional review, you yes. did not say anything. So I can also jump. Oh, no, I'll let you speak. We have a lot of time. Eh? We have, I just want to do right, with Nagat okay. and All then right. we let that run okay. go. In the studio, we'll make sure we finish everything <laughs> okay. before we, we go. We can't finish everything. No, no I mean, what's the things okay. you have on mind now? Right. I mean, in mind mm. now, we will deal with it. So, Doc, I know you also want to catch my attention, yeah. but you have to hold on for now. Okay. Mr. Christian Adaipo, who is president of Nagrat. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening, my brother. Thank you very much for joining us, and thanks for having patience and staying on the line. Um, we, you know, basically we're looking at education, and um, the, the 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 Green Book also mentions a few things. I'm sure you have seen the Green Book for yourself. You've been looking at it. That issues about tertiary education, which will be your basic area for now. Talking about infrastructural facilities for effective teaching and learning having been improved in the existing public tertiary institutions, government broadening the student loan trust to cover all tertiary institutions, the bills for the establishment of the University of Ghana, health and allied sciences in the Volta region, University of Energy and Natural Resources in Bronga Hafu passed in 2011. In terms of human resource training development, since 2009, government through Get Fund has been providing hundreds of scholarships, not only in anticipation of employment, but also ensuring that Ghanaians are trained to take full control of the following areas, oil, etc. 673 Ghanaian students benefited from higher training, head office building for Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences under construction, etc. What, from where you sit, would you make of government's claim of an unprecedented achievement in the area of tertiary education? Yes, let me make a few comments before um, and clarify some issues. Um, let me say that I have not personally had a copy of the book to read. And secondly, NAGRAT does not represent uh, teachers in the uh, tertiary institutions. We are representing teachers in the senior high schools and okay. um, junior high schools. You are just so graduate I'll teachers. If your question will be directed okay. to that area, I'll be able to handle them better. That is absolutely correct. So, in that area, second cycle education, what do you say? Yes, uh, from what I have heard in the news and other things, um, I think government uh, is trying to let. Ghanaians know what they have done over the past three years. I have no problem about that. And as to whether it is unprecedented or not, it depends on how you look at it. Mm. Because somebody can do something and score about, let's say somebody has done a project up to 90%, you come and add 1%. The 1% has made it 91%. And the 91% is unprecedented. So it depends on how we look at it and define it. But um, let me look at some of the issues that I have heard in the public discourse. Um, the mention is made of untrained teachers in the in the uh, public basic schools who are now being trained. And then um, let me say that it's a, it's a good idea that government is uh, making it public that untrained teachers are being trained all over. Yes, it was started somewhere and they have come to continue. But the point is, we have not reached a stage that we can really beat our chest and say that we have done so well. Because statistics that are available to us indicate that um, we still have a chunk of untrained teachers in the system who are still handling our children. Mm. And that does not occur well for quality education in the country. As we speak, if you go to preschool education, that's the kindergarten level, we have as much as 74% of the teachers there being untrained. If you go to primary schools, you have about 38% of the teachers there being untrained. You go to senior, uh, junior high schools, we still have about 22% still untrained. And so we really cannot beat our chest and say that we 
because we continue to organize on training teachers program for teachers to be professionalized. We have done so well. We need um, a massive training that will encompass all the people who are now delivering that what I would call half baked education to our children because they have not been professionally trained. Apart from that, um, I've also heard in the public discourse that salaries have been mentioned. Okay, yes, I was going to that. True that um, teacher salaries have seen upward adjustment over the years. It says for degree but, holders from 385 to 780. Yes. Um, I will not be able to do the mathematics and know uh, the ratio increase over the years. But one thing that is clear to us is that, well, nobody expected that within the past three years, salaries will be stagnant when cost of living continues to escalate. So it is commendable that government has implemented single spine and has made sure that um, teacher salaries have been adjusted over the years, at least to be able to compete with in, uh, the cost of living in the country. But I will not be the final judge to this. I think the teachers in the classroom, the teachers all over the country, will have to know whether their conditions have been improved um, to the level that we can really trumpet and then um, beat our chest and say that we have done so well for teachers in this country. Yes, but the point is that nobody would deny the fact that the government has really um, improved upon salaries in the country. But that, this is not the first time that salaries have been increased, and this is not going to be the last time. Insofar as the indices of cost of living, uh, living continue to change, definitely salaries will have to also change to commensurate and to be able to um, stand at par with um, the cost of living in the country. So that, that, these are the few comments I'll make for the time being. I'll throw in a few areas as well for you. Uh, that 43 million excise books were distributed to primary schools in 2011 in addition to, 20, uh, 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 in addition to 2010. Uh, we're saying that government has replaced 1,250 1, schools under trees and on the salary bid that you mentioned. But look at second cycle education on page uh, 17 of the book. Uh, just to you know, give you a little more information, 672 emergency classroom blocks and dormitories at various stages of completion to cater for the N MPP's increase in SHS duration to four years while failing to make adequate arrangements, etc. 300 of these classroom blocks and dormitories already completed. I'll jump uh, in line with its social democratic principles aiming at making secondary education accessible to every Ghanaian child uh, of school going age by 2016. Restoration of 30% admission to SHS level to local students within a 10 mile radius where schools are situated. Revamping collapsed science resource centers. 59 of them have been refurbished so far. Government through Get Fund providing 5,000 maths and science scholarships under master's program. And also between 2013 and 2015, government intends establishing additional 200 community second cycle schools throughout the length and breadth of the country. This is an attempt to at least give you an idea of what second, second cycle education is said to be in the Green Book. What do you say to all of that? Yes, um, I would say that uh, as of now, I'm not in a position to dispute the figures that have been put there. I will have to do a lot of um, verification to find out whether they are true. If they are true, they are commendable that some of these things are done. But that notwithstanding, we still have a lot to do. Because if you go to the basic schools that we are saying we have elevated, uh, I mean, eliminated schools under trees. Under the new Education Act of um, 2008, uh, kindergarten education is supposed to be part of the mainstream um, primary school education. But as you speak, we still have a deficit of 1,158 uh, primary schools who do not have kindergarten education. And that means that we still have about um, 263,000 Ghanaian children um, who are supposed to feed into these um, kindergartens every year who are not being given the chance. Um, so if you are eliminating schools under trees and we are building schools for them, are we really also catering for the kindergarten education which is supposed to be the, the, the starting point? for our education. Also, I also want to say that while well, we might be eliminating schools under trees, but what are the type of buildings that we are putting up? Are, they, are these buildings conducive enough to accommodate our children? Um, if you go to most schools in this country, you see that schools lack toilet facilities. Some cases, teachers Boys and girls all have to be learned to uh, attend nature's call in one toilet facility. 
some schools don't even have at all. So when we talk about the school environment, let us not only limit ourselves to the classrooms that the students will be sitting to learn. There are so many other things that need to be added because the children are going to stay there for more than six to eight hours in a day. And they have... They it seems we lost Mr. Christian Adaipoku, president of Nagrat, but I must say thank you to him all the same for, uh, for making... Uh, uh, for joining us on the show and stating your case. Now, I don't know who to come to because the minister has already accused me <laughs> of not saying anything when Doc said something. And uh, these no, accusations... I take it in good faith, though, because I know I'll give you the opportunity to say what you have to say. Yeah. But are you responding to the first point he made about the voter point? So before he moves on to the unprecedented... Yes, I... Okay, I so on that point... Make a comment on that and then make a comment on the uh, inflation coming down in GDP and then also make a comment on the education... No, I team. want you to address that one first. Okay. I'll well, go back to him, then we can move on to that okay. one. And then we have to do our Greek as well. So right, we have to right. be quick. Okay, thank you. Mm. No, I think I agree that mm. um, universities or education or for that matter, any other development process needs to start. And right. perhaps it needs to start incrementally. I mean, there, nobody would dispute that fact at all. Right. And I believe that mean, that's what many Ghanaians are expecting. Maybe uh, since the president made the announcement that two universities were going to be uh, established. Right. Uh, however, we need to perhaps move beyond, um, we, need, we need to push the limits of the discourse beyond the brick and mortar notion of university. Um, putting up bungalows for registrar, vice chancellor, pro vice chancellor, lecture halls and all those things. It's not just what it takes to build a university. I would prefer to hear more about libraries, computer labs, numbers of lecturers that are being hired right now. Mm. And the reason I even mentioned that is because Currently, our public universities are understaffed in many, many ways. And so adding two more, we have to be asking, ourselves, what are we doing to attract young, brilliant, talented Ghanaian students, Ghanaians who are finishing their PhDs abroad, mm. to come and man some of these universities? Because what we want to turn out of these universities are quality human resources mm. that will eventually go out into the society and impact the economy, impact society, and impact governance more broadly. So we need to also be thinking about the computer labs, the libraries, um, the, the hostels, um, the, lecture, the lecture halls, and everything else. But at the end of the day, we also need to be talking more specifically about the books and the materials and the, the networking that is needed for students and lecturers to be able to access journals across the, ac across the, the global divide. That, for me, it is extremely important. Mm. And even if it is 10 students who are going to be admitted now, more resources will be going into those areas. We will, turn out, we will be better off turning out 10 highly trained students. That's will eventually come back to perhaps help expand the faculty and spend more resources on these infrastructure areas rather than, I mean, being too obsessed with um, the okay. large buildings and things. So let me go back to uh, Honorable, and you wanted to make a point. Well, let, let, me, let me quickly say that if you call the, uh, the university chairman of the university council mm. and the administrator of the university, the questions that you are asking, I believe that very experienced and seasoned academicians and administrators have been recruited to do those jobs. And so I believe that all this... Uh, they will be addressing them by now. They won't mm. set up the university without thinking about the computer labs and the libraries and all those things. Mm. But this book cannot contain all. But let me say that I believe that overall, mm. these are the issues that we're confronting uh, a university uh, of, of such uh, status. Mm. And definitely, they will be looking at these issues. Mm. Uh, when the, the Nagra chairman was speaking, I, I thought that at least he would have, he have taken some pains to visit one or two schools to see exactly what has taken place mm. now. In fact, the, 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 now the intervention, the design of schools that are being constructed all over the place are multi-purpose schools that are addressing issues of library, staff common hall, and etc. So you see huge buildings for primary schools, not only for classrooms, but toilet and other facilities are all included. Because we, as, as he was saying, these are the the things that makes the school, you can't just go and construct a school. Mm -hmm. You don't have place of convenience for right. the children. I went and commissioned uh, a, a school project, a, J, a, a, a junior high school project in Hull recently. And they are using WCs. They have overhead tanks and everything. And it was exciting. They have even come up to some new technology for uh, the, uh, where they are, they, they are using even the uh, uh, byproduct of the toilet for manure and all those things in the home uh, you know, municipality. So these are all encapsulated in the, in, the, in the overall planning of the schools that are being constructed now. Now, you, you, in the second cycle institution, I, I thought he would have confirmed that there has been massive injection 
of resources in senior high schools. Mm. I just came from the Eastern region where I was a regional minister. Mm. And I can tell you that schools that have been in existence for years without seeing any expansion and infrastructure development mm. and which find themselves in very outlandish communities, all of a sudden, story buildings, 12 units and 16 units, classroom blocks and, and dormitories are springing up. You are talking about the Manguasi Senior High Schools. You are talking about AME Zion uh, uh, Senior High School in mm. Old Tafu. We are talking about uh, uh, Queen St. Michael Senior High School. We are talking about Akukwasi Senior High School. Uh, typical rural schools which did not dream of uh, getting such infrastructure are having uh, story building, dormitory blocks and classrooms all over the place. Okay. So it underscores the fact that when we say that about 670 something, you know, schools have been... When we... I, his Excellency the President undertook his nationwide tour. I was, with him, I was with him in the Upper East region. Mm. We went to Golu, the, uh, you know, the birthplace of, of uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Liman. A new school altogether has been constructed. About 15 structures have been constructed to mm. give them a new secondary school. Uh, or another community, the same uh, uh, you know, uh, district there, uh, Wa East, a new school has been constructed with all the infrastructure there. Okay. So I think that when we talk about unprecedented nature, the people there will tell you that what has happened in their district and their community is very unprecedented. Okay. We talk about 66,000 laptops being distributed to basic schools. Isn't it unprecedented? So as for the word unprecedented, I think that we can argue about, about it, but most of the issues that have been raised, especially in this area, we are not beating our chest that some of the achievements and some of the challenges that uh, the Nagrat president spoke about are not there. As for the challenges, we can't overcome them okay. overnight. We have to but move over we to have agriculture. To admit mm. that a lot has been achieved in the area of education, in the area of infrastructure, in the area of schools under trees, in the area of school uniforms. Thank you. Forty. No, let me just end up. Okay, please. Three do. million school children mm. have been supplied with school, free school uniform. Mm. Forty-three million school children have been supplied with free. Uh, Forty-three million free exercise book has been supplied. If you were with me. When children from a typical village in Achimansa came and, and, and collected their school uniform and wore it and went home and they were carried shoulder high and their parents were so happy, you understand the kind of impact that social intervention by government is making on their life. I'll stop you right there. Thank you very much. Let's move over to agriculture. Doc, I know you want something, but I'll give you, when we are rounding up, perhaps you have to put your power of summary to test okay. and round it up. Let's talk about agriculture. One million metric tons of cocoa. Uh, uh, which you have already cited, and it's also mentioned that that will be the lead story for agriculture. There's also issue about livestock, livestock sector distributing 335,000 cockerels to 1,700 uh, small-scale farmers and some other things. Honorable Minister, I'm staying with you. Why would you call those uh, unprecedented? Well, one million tons of cocoa production is unprecedented. Okay. Has and it turned Ghana around? In Definitely, Ghana. In the, terms of cocoa, no, no, the, even cocoa. The backbone of this country, for a very long time, has been cocoa, and cocoa continue to support our economy. So once you are increasing cocoa production, mm. and you see, what is significant is that at the time that we have hit oil, and mm. you know, in Nigeria, when they discovered oil, they forgot about cocoa, mm. and we have said that we would not allow the state of affairs that bedeviled our brothers and sisters from Nigeria to. Be devil us, mm. and for that matter, we are not going to, uh, you know, be over reliant on oil and then forget about agriculture, which has been a long, long backbone uh, for, for a long time the backbone of this country economy. So, the fact that we are injecting more resources, more ideas, more technology, more high tech approach to uh, cocoa production, which is increasing our cocoa production and still maintaining the quality mm -hmm. of Ghana cocoa, is, is something that we What about the distribution of, of these uh, uh, cockerels to the small scale farmers? Well, how significant is it's that? It's very, very significant. Look, this Christmas, my ministry, together with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, mm -hmm. organized some of these cockerels projects mm -hmm. and then we distributed to, you know, we want to improve upon the protein uh, level of our people, especially those living in rural areas. And we gave these cockerels to them as subsidized cost. And I went into some communities and visited them. And in four months during Christmas, some who bought about 10, 15, and others were able to feed their family on the cockerels and sold some of them even to support the, 
the, the, the, the, the domestic economy of, of their families. Mm. And so for me, the, the person living there, getting access, sometimes even on Christmas Day, getting money to buy coffee is a problem for them. Okay. So by supplying them the day old, allowing them to do free range, and then growing for them to sell some and then, and then consume some to improve upon their protein, it's very significant. Okay. I have the former president of the Poultry Farmers Association, Ken Kwati, on the line. And, Doc, I'll come to you. Trust me. And I'll you must you also time. remember that I'm a farmer. I'm a poultry farmer myself. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Ken Kwati is on the line. He's a poultry farmer's association, former president of the Poultry Farmers Association. Good evening to you, Ken. Hello. Hello, Ken. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Let me just ask you one question. I'm sure you can deal with all the matters. Basically, we had issues about corn prices. We've also had issues about life, the livestock industry. We've had issues about how it co is doing compared to uh, importation. Uh, Honorable Minister tells us that there's been distribution of cockerels, etc., to promote protein, etc., to help people grow uh, uh, these day old chicks into fair business for themselves and also improve on their protein intake and all. What is your assessment of what government is saying it has done in the Green Book? Well, um, I focused on the livestock and uh, I would suppose that uh, poultry comes under that. That's right. It's an area that uh, I have, uh, I'm uh, both a pra practitioner and an advocate uh, for. Um, and I think uh, we simply just have to put this in some form of context. Um, you know, we have a situation where over the years we've allowed uh, ourselves to be swarmed with imports and there's been an import surge um, that has marginalized uh, commercial poultry production um, to the extent that I believe we are close to importing anywhere between 100 to 150 million birds or the equivalent of a year, depending on who you wish to listen to. And for me, if you take the promises and commitments made by this government when they were in opposition with regards to the poultry uh, industry, and then you juxtaposition it to what has been highlighted in this green book as achievements, then I have to wonder um, whether we should really be calling these achievements because um, what, we, uh, what is being cited as achievements to me can basically be des described as a, a poverty alleviation strategy and a temporary one at that. Um, and so I cannot see how this can be a highlight for an achievement. Uh, and, and quite frankly, uh, I think anyone who sits back and looks at this in context will be surprised that it's called a highlight. It's something that has been done. I'm not going to condemn it, but I don't see how that can be considered as an achievement when it comes to the poultry industry, certainly. Okay, all right. Um, um, Mr. Quartier, I have to thank you for that. Our time is really up, but I think your point is made. Thank you very much for your time yeah. with us tonight on the show. We wish you the very best of the evening. Let me come back to you, Doc. Uh, I've, I've kept you mute for yes. some time. Marginalize me for some time. <laughs> when both guests say the same thing of me, I'm fine. <laughs> it means yeah. I'm, doing, I'm treating you the same way. That's good. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I, let me just take a quick one on the on the uh, agricultural issue and um, pe specifically on the on the cocoa uh, issue. Right. Of course, I mean, uh, we expect that when when investments are made in the area of cocoa or any other product, for instance, mm. we should be able to get higher yields. But what is of essence, especially in the area of achievement here, should be whether we are able to transform these cocos from the raw beans that we are producing to some form of finished products. In other words, what percentage of the over 1 million metric tons of cocoa that we produce in a single year were we able to uh, transform into chocolate, into cocoa powder, into milo, and so on and so forth mm. in this country? 
and what percentage of the, the, the husk of the cocoa are we also able to transform into wine as others ha have been doing mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. the, reason this, the reason why looking at it from that angle speaks better of achievement is that it also then provides employment and puts people in some long-term sustainable jobs mm -hmm. and boosts the domestic economy and reduces the importation of this particular product. So mm -hmm. I would have looked at achievements from that particular angle as mm -hmm. far as cocoa is concerned and as far as po even pottery is concerned. If you look at the highlights of livestock, uh, 35,000 distributed to 1,700 1, small-scale farmers in five regions, right. Eastern, Central, Greater Accra, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you put that in the context of the uh, explanation of the Honorable Minister, with, with all due respect, what, what it se seems to suggest is that these cockroaches were distributed purposely for consumption. Because uh, as the minister himself said, the people raised them and then within Christmas they were able to uh, sell it, boost their, their domestic economies and then, I mean, eat the rest or whatever the case may be. We should probably be looking at this in, in a much, much bigger scale to the extent that we can boost the poultry industry in a manner that will completely cut the aprons of importation of poultry products from, from abroad. And so we, if we are able to do that, then what it means is that we have changed the existing metrics because over the years, this is what has been the trend. Over the years, we have been depending on import of this particular product. Achievement, in my view, comes in when we recognize that that particular trajectory is not the best for us. We cut it and we transfer that trajectory into a domestic trajectory that makes us much more independent and makes us makes our domestic economy viable in a manner that absorbs the teeming unemployed, un unemployed youth. Now, if you come to the area of economy, which the minister mentioned, inflation, GDP. I think the government needs to be commended for all those, I mean, stabilized manner in which they have handled the economy. But the key question here is, and especially in the context of a social democratic party, how is this reflecting in the pockets of ordinary Ghanaians? And I think that their ability to reframe these particular highlights and point to the link between keeping inflation as a single digit, keeping GDP at where they've kept it, and so on and so forth, and how the that affects the Ghanaian individual's pocket as far as going to Agbogoloshi or Kanishi or the more is concerned, is what will make the difference between just putting the figure down and giving somebody a connection between him or herself and that particular figure. Let me take, okay. Now, a quick one on the Nagrat president issue. Yes, please. I hope you can he, make it Yes, happy. he talked about uh, on train teachers. Past 10. Of, of course, mm -hmm. he's talked about on train teachers mm -hmm. and the, the concern and everything. I think both the GES and the NAGRAT and NAT needs to really sit up and do some introspection. The reason is that if you look at the 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 the, the nature of the nature of our the structure of our educational system, mm -hmm. the large number of private schools in this country use untrained teachers. The paradox is that compared to the public schools, the private schools produce better students or the students that go to the private schools turn out better. Okay. So the question is probably not about the train, but it's about supervision and monitoring of the teachers that we have in the public school system. Let me take some messages to, uh, because I mean, we have quite a number. Uh, Aboto says, hi, Nin, this document must be called the Red Book of Gagantuan failure of President Mills' government. All right, we hear you. Uh, let's move on to the next one, if we open up. And I hope the internet will not be playing any games on me today, as he has been doing all week. Difficulty opening to the next one. Okay, Derek says, Ni, it is the duty of every government to build strong econo a strong economy for real jobs. But this government has done extremely well in just three years. Therefore, unprecedented. Okay, so he says that the unprecedented word is the right one to use. Um, still, snail space, trying to move on to the next one. As I try to work on that, perhaps I should be taking your final comments on the, on the show because we have to be running out. I have a truckload of messages. You have to find a way to get the messages to me for me to read. Honorable, you well, first. I, I, I will still keep to the fact that we have achieved a number right. of unprecedented. Uh, first, I will talk about the $3 billion uh, loan that you have contracted. The biggest. Single I facility. Really, should we be talking of a loan? Well, let's we wait, well, well, wait for your closing remarks. Well, okay. well <laughs> I, I think it's an achievement because <laughs> today we are tackling one of the greatest challenge in terms of road construction facing us, linking the north to the south through mm -hmm. the Eastern Corridor Road. Mm -hmm. And for us, if you're able to get this loan to work on this road, which is connecting 20 political districts in this country, and you think that by sourcing that resources to construct this road, which will shorten the distance between then the, the north from, from the north to south by about let's say three hours or so. 
eight economic gains cannot be quantified. Right. Again, there are several other things. In my ministry, for instance, if you give me the chance, I will tell you, for the first time in the history of our decentralization process, we have supplied about 8,000 motorbikes to our assembly members and men and women to enable them to facilitate their movement and send you know, local government to the doorsteps of the people. Mm. We talk about uh, the Founders' Day celebration. We had a founder for all this while. We know what Nkrumah has done. Nkrumah has been eulogized. Nkrumah has been, you go to the AU today, uh, it's monumental, uh, you know, uh, a statue in, in honor of Nkrumah. You go elsewhere. As a nation, we did not even see it fit to honor him. This government came and we have, we have honored him with the Founders' Day. It's unprecedented. So the, the, the number of unprecedented here, unprecedented here, if we want to talk Not about the number the of fire, book is saying that everything. The fire service, <laughs> the fire service. We right. are all in this country. When fire engulfed the, uh, the foreign affairs you ministry. Should, I hear you have to run out the foreign 30, affairs in 30 ministry, seconds. And fire officers were standing in our watching because mm. they couldn't do anything because of the height of the building. Mm. Today, we have imported about 150 fire tenders fitted with the state of the art equipment. Our Navy have been given new vessels in order to control seconds. our territorial waters. Our Air Force has been given a new lease of life by new aircraft in order to uh, protect our airspace and help in medical evacuation and other emergencies that will come. I think that three and a half years of President Mills' rule, this achievement, I can't find any other word apart from but to say it is unprecedented. Doc, your final uh, words. Okay, thank you very much. Nee. I mean, I think that... Um, if you look at the list, and perhaps we need some, uh, what do you call it, um, some measure of validation. We need, and this is probably the role of media. People should go out there and validate uh, some of these claims that have been made in the book. And I don't doubt them um, at all. But what I can say about in each of these bulleted points that I've subsequently explained is that many of them are initiatives that have just begun. And the real achievement will depend on mechanisms that are put in place to sustain them and see them to the very finish line. For instance, street lights on the motorways and everything, we have seen it before. The question is, what do you put in place to sustain it? What do you put in place to ensure that sometime in the future, we will not return to um, the darkness that comes back to the road? But in the future, if the government had to write this book, if I have to take the street light idea again, they would need to go beyond just stating the number of street lights or the street lights that have been indicated. How is this street light translating or connecting to the ordinary person who is also a voter and a citizen and a participant in the labor market okay. as well because this is the way your the, the, achievements the will speak will attacked by armed robbers okay the so you need to say it. we will do the discussion <laughs> at, at the end of the and, show and, 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 those and, are your I'm final just, words I'm, each. I'm just happy he has said all these things are beginning mm. the process that are ongoing mm. it underscores the fact that four more years for Atamus Thank you very much. Uh, I think we can take some messages if you work. George, Borga contractors who worked on the schools and the trees are yet to be paid. So what do ND, what does the NDC mean by unprecedented? Okay, there's uh, yet another one. Somehow, uh, tricks on me today on this iPad. Uh, somehow I thought it was going to work, but it looks like it's just one that rolled over. Fortunately, a whole host of messages, but we cannot read them for you.